welcome. Let me see. Uh, okay. Welcome everybody. This is the uh, MS in Architecture Computational Technologies program at the New York Institute of Technology School of Architecture and Design. I'm Pablo Lorenzo Iroa. I'm the director of the program. And um, one second, I have feedback. Uh, and um, today we're going to have our inaugural uh, lecture uh, uh, given by uh, Professor uh, Michael wensen Su. Uh, the lecture series is a, a special lecture that is combining, a uh, special series that is combining some of the issues that we discussed uh, last semester and some of the issues that we're going to be discussing this semester. Uh, they are uh, around the problem of uh, information, architecture of information, and they are related to artificial intelligence and robotic fabrication. The MS uh, in Architecture Computational Technologies lecture series aims at discussing research framed by invited guest speakers. Uh, the program focuses on architecture expanding relationship between science, technology, and culture through innovation in algorithms, simulations, arti ar uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, robotic fabrication, and materials. The spring 2022 lecture series discusses alternative means to understand the dialects between the ideal digital and the physical digital. Within an architecture of information, uh, uh, we are thought, uh, information is thought as an actualization of interfaces. And uh, we understand this process in terms of information flows and their actualizations as architecture. The lecture today, uh, is entitled uh, Of Houses and Surfaces, Retracing and Rethinking by Mr. Fuller's Trajectory from the Dimaxion to the Geo. And it's by Michael wensen Su, an adjunct associate professor at Pratt Institute of Architecture. Uh, the lecture description is the following. Despite his lack of formal architectural training, but Mr. Fuller's contribution to architecture has been profound and unmatched. While his life work is well studied due in no small part to his lifelong drive to document every aspect and conserve every co correspondent of his life, this lecture seeks to retrace and thereby rethink the trajectory of his work, which was marked at its inception by its idiosyncratic, impossible Dimaxion house, and its terminus by the fanciful and uh, all too possible geodesic dome. In particular, this lecture seeks to reconsider Fuller as an innate outsider whose uncanny capacity for thinking outside the box led him to conceive of architecture, not merely as the provision of shelter or the control of the environment, but as the synthesis and manipulation of information. Michael wensen Su is an adjunct associate professor at Pratt Institute School of Architecture, which has been coordinating and instructed the degree project for over 10 years. His work is driven by his belief that architecture has long been limited by its bias for the physical over the ephemeral. That is prevailing pedagogies and practices of architectural design over emphasize the production of hardware while only presuming the efficacy or even applicability of any associated software. As a result, while every, uh, every physical aspect of a building may be denoted by countless and ever more novel means of generation and representation, the models of its actual interaction, or for that matter, the intrinsic variability of the interface between a building and its user, its environment, and its manifold constant, uh, context are rarely considered. Instead, Michael argues for reconsidering architectural design as a simultaneous conception and implementation of strategies and tactics for superimposing and then willfully mediating the many and varied relationship proportions, connections, effects between static physical hardware and dynamic ephemeral software, a notion he calls machinic architecture. Michael is a graduate of Caltech, Columbia University, the Cooper Union and Princeton University. Welcome Michael, uh, the floor is yours. So thank you so much for joining us. And it's a pleasure to hosting you in our program. Thank you so much. Pablo, thank you for the invitation and congratulations on your very new program 
and a very exciting mandate, and I think very soon to have far-reaching implications. Thank you as well, by extension to the NYIT community. I hope to see you all in person very soon so I can see and hear and learn more from you as you develop your program and as you see the very first graduates of your inaugural class. Now, Pablo, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so you should be seeing the first slide. Generally, like any story, this lecture has three parts. We'll talk about the Damaxian, then we'll move on to the geo with a dash so that it's understood as a prefix for many different manifestations. And then in turn, time permitting, we'll talk about some of the possible applications and in particular from my instruction and from my own work. So looking through your syllabus and looking through this statement by Pablo on your program website, there's something I really wanted to focus on for today's lecture. And that is also because that's the particularities of my own interest. Specifically, and this is of course, words that you're all very familiar with. Specifically, I like to focus on two words, that of interfaces and interactivity. One connotes the other. Having more than one interface means that, of course, there are many different ways of interacting with something. Having the notion of activity means, of course, something changes before, something happens during, something happens even after, so that in turn, the surfaces have to interact with whatever interface you're interacting with. This particular concern, this particular interest is something I've been exploring lately in a few seminars I've been teaching over at Pratt Institute. This is a fourth year seminar in our undergraduate program. And as you can see here, it's actually called the theories and practices of architectural interfaces. So this I think is the moment of conjunction with the particular interests and mandate of your master of science program. For some of you, maybe you're familiar with that image on the bottom. That is from 1732 Bushnell's turtle, the very first submarine that had been used successfully and then eventually lost but what's really particular about this notion of the interface is an idea that I hope we can keep discussing and returning to and perhaps exploring further throughout the context of this lecture. That is to say, the human body is surrounded by a surface, a surface which you can touch, which you can see, which you can push, which you can smell. And of course, this surface in turn becomes the manner and mode by which the human being in the middle, inside this very confined space, actually in turn, connects and interacts with the outside world. In the context of the seminar I taught, we explored different kinds of interfaces, notions of relativity driven particularly by Fuller's own writings on applying relativity to ideas of architectural design, also notions of uncertainty coming from Siegfried Gideon's reading of transparency in the new modern architecture that was coming to the foreground at the time of his writing. Notions of the machinic, which Pablo has already mentioned too, of which I consider myself just a small subset of a whole much more diverse, much wider range of interfaces and various different systems, all of which most importantly connote this idea that the interface really emphasizes the notion of the face, meaning the surface. And it is on this surface that on the one side, presents itself as interface and on the other side presents itself as interactivity. In other words, the surface in this case is not just a divider but a connector from one side to the other. How you use something changes the interface. How the interface changes, changes how you use it. This is, as you can imagine, the exact discourse that we're exploring in the context of architectural design. For Fuller in particular, and this is now going back to 1932, you see here images from MoMA, very famously 1932, when for the first time, there were different articles written about Corbusier's book, Vision Architecture, which had just been translated into English in 1926. So his ideas were becoming visible, coming to the foreground until eventually in 1932, this whole wave of, as they call the modern style or the international style became manifest in a very, in some ways, paradoxical exhibition over in MoMA. So you see here, for example, in terms of the extrapolation of the ideas from Corbusier's book, immediately the notion of taking 
Corbusier's descriptions of the house can be translated into his vision of the future city, even at this early days. So here now is the connection. This is the first part of the lecture, that of the Dymaxion. It's a word that's a hybrid that was invented by Buckminster Fuller. Here you see some major chronologies, born 1895, passed away 1983. Some critical chronologies preceding in 1929 his Dymaxion house is his naval service in communications and diagnostics, as well his experience with his father-in-law, James Hewitt, who was a noted architect in New York, where they invented and they tried to implement what they called a stockade building system, which is supposed to be a way to quickly erect houses out of inexpensive, plentiful materials, which then developed into ideas of lightful houses until finally it took the form of the Damaxian house. That is, of course, the term we're all very familiar with. But besides the Damaxian, as a house, as an idea, it was also explored much more thoroughly and deeply by a group of people, specifically in 1932, for Shelter Magazine, a magazine that Fuller took over with his insurance savings and thereby changing greatly the content of the magazine to suit his own purposes. Part and parcel, as you can imagine, of this turn of events in 1932 is the position of the Shelter Magazine as a counterpoint to the very rigidly in some ways, pedagogical constraints of MoMA, highlighting only specific architects, highlighting certain styles, highlighting certain materials and representations as opposed to something else. Moving on to different eras, the car, the map, the Wichita house, better known mainly because it was developed during the war as a way to quickly house soldiers deployed overseas. Until in 47, just after the war, he developed this idea of the geodesic dome. So this is very much the transition that we'll be exploring in this first part of the lecture. So if you see Fuller on the left, that's a sculpture of him by Isamo Noguchi from 1929. Noguchi here, under the influence of Fuller, as they were very close friends, they hung out all the time, they visited each other all the time. Noguchi was influenced by Fuller to say, hey, why don't you try to make a sculpture? not out of clay, not out of brass, not out of bronze, not out of something normal, but out of the latest, newest material, which in this case was chromium plated steel. Chromium plated steel had been invented about 1920, but it was not fully commercialized until 1926 or so by the New York, New Jersey chromium plating company. So with chromium plating, all of a sudden, not only do we have a new material, we actually have a new way of preserving the longevity and in turn the appearance of materials. On the left, for example, Noguchi inspired by the use of this material, aspired to create a sculpture that is fully reflective, that has no shadows, where from every moment, every surface, as you walk around the sculpture, you see your own face reflected as opposed to the sculpture itself. Later on, however, Noguchi would go back and make this very curious sculpture, 1930, called Glad Day. Here you can see, however, the opposite material, the opposite extreme, where instead of smoothing over surfaces and materials, we see a sculpture that is almost still in its clay-like material that almost keeps traces of the fingerprints of the pressure of the sculptor at hand. But at the same time, of course, the figure suggests an optimism and an idea of expanding the surfaces around this figure, which is going to be pivotal to our discussion of Fuller. Specifically, in the context of surfaces, we think about surfaces as how we see the world through our lenses. We smell the world through the olfactory surfaces in our nose. And of course, because of the pandemic, lately, all of us have been learning more than we ever wanted to about the blood air barrier of the alveoli of our lungs. One of the reasons why, as we know, COVID is so hurtful is exactly because it completely ruptures this surface, the only means we have of exchanging oxygen with our blood. The particular connection of this idea of this figure pushing away at the world is how Fuller, when he took over the magazine, and even though in early issues, he featured more normative notions of architecture. For example, you see on the left, the Mies building, you see on the left as well, making a comparison between mass producing airplanes and the skyscrapers dotting New York City still at the time. 
and later on when he decided that neither of these manifestations were sufficient. Instead, he took on two sculptures by Noguchi to bookend, literally. Here you see Shuttle Magazine, Volume 2, Number 5, from November 1932. This is the very last issue of Shuttle produced under Fuller's management, under Fuller's editorialship, under Fuller's organization of all the various computer contributors to its content. So what can we make of this change? How did shelter come from something very clear and simple, provision of shelter, housing people, to something on a larger scale, to these two figures bookending this particular issue? Some clues to this can be found on the contents of this particular issue. This is what we see for the first time, for example, Fuller describing his own notions of architecture, what architecture can be instead. On the right, this is a later article, but on the right were for the artwork, he describes a building that looks like a tree. And in this case, because it looks like a tree, it can be hung from the middle, but also because it can be hung from the middle, meaning that it's been designed to distribute its center of gravity along its axis and thereby make it possible to think about the efficiency of the materials, making it possible, for example, to see here in the middle figure, a whole tower made out of this material, made out of this arrangement, a whole tower that looks like a tree, actually weighs much, much less than even a simple single family home. This is what Fuller called the 4D architecture, which then developed develop into Dimaxian architecture. 4D, as you can imagine, connotes the notion of time, which for Fuller was a way to think about the fourth dimension as time, which then corresponds directly into how do we plan ourselves out in terms of the pursuit of architecture? Do we only design something that's supposed to last forever, or do we design something that actually can be transported, transported and mobile to such a degree, in fact, that this very fanciful tower as you can see by the cartoon on the left, can actually be lifted by the Zeppelin, the latest technology at the time, the massive balls of hydrogen floating along, which carries with it the tower, and the Zeppelin releases a bomb, a bomb that excavates the ground and then literally allows the, power, the tower to be lowered and then planted and pulled down with tension cables that then holds it in place. Besides this notion of this tower that is so light that can be transported, that can be planted like a tree, is of course the inverse. That is to say, after planting, the building could equally be unplanted, be then therefore transported to other places, perhaps even gathering in numbers as necessary or dispersing in numbers as desired. In 1929, Fuller was already exploring these ideas. In this case, for example, making a presentation to the Architectural League of New York. The introduction to Fuller is, I think, still emblematic of how Fuller is considered. Here, as we see, Mr. Fuller, unfortunately, is not an architect and still more fortunately, he's not an engineer. So because of that, he can think much more freely to think about a proper kind of machine to adequately serve for living purposes. This, of course, is the connection to Corbusier's use of the word machine in the context of architectural design. Now let's now hear from Fuller speaking in his own voice. Next to his Dimaxian house. This is the first and very crude paper model of a house designed for industrial reproduction. It's Requirements must be that it should be proof against fire, floods, tornado, earthquake, electrical storms, and marauders. It must be proof against drudgery, that is, in it must be accessories with which a housewife can accomplish all her house cleaning within 15 minutes. Fanciful. And also impressive, the idea of a house that can resist marauders, that can resist lightning storms, also earthquakes, and all sorts of natural disasters, but at the same time, actually make it possible to lighten the chores of daily life. So looking more closely, specifically, as delineated in particular in the 1932 issue of Shelter Magazine, we can see here Fuller, for example, emphasizing the idea that is Dimaxian house, is amenable exactly to, first of all, being mass produced, just like cars, just like airplanes, also distributed as a package because its component can be flat packed, just like IKEA furniture. 
Because of that, it can be erected quickly, generally speaking, because of mass production and because of the distribution of materials, the cost is reasonable and accessible, perhaps a little more than a car, but not much more. Because of its symmetry, it is less sensitive to its orientation relative to the cardinal directions, to sun, to wind, to light. Because of its materials, it is inherently resistant to fire. Also because of its overall profile, it is resistant to strong wind loads as wind will load on both sides equally without creating high pressure one side or the other, which then of course in turn compromises the structure of the house. And at the very end, as we talked about before, the idea that a house can be demounted demounted to be transported and taken elsewhere. So reading from Fuller's text, what he says here is, what we are witnessing is the disappearance of the ever less economic housing or slow motion phase of machinery, as its functions are taken over by the high speed machinery that brings about and maintains the preferred environment conditions at ever less cost and personal effort. So if we think about the Maxian house then, at its very onset, its model is that of the car. Its model is that also of the airplane in terms of its efficient use of materials. In this image on the right, you can see Fuller very carefully and intentionally positions that little weird sausage looking like a car below. That is his Damaxian house, invented, developed, prototyped at around the same time to show how this house works alongside this kind of car. This revolution in mobility is transplanted not only to the car, but directly intrinsic to the house itself. This is something, this is a cue Fuller took directly from Le Corbusier in his L'Esprit Nouveau. We see, for example, Corbusier trying to use the latest, newest cars, the Degat, for example, to highlight, to highlight the advancement of his architecture relative to the latest technology of the cars at the time. Now, what is the impetus? And this is something I think is very important and often waylaid in discussions of Fuller when he talks about his Dimaxian house. This is the context of the Dimaxian house. For those of you near Columbus Circle still in person at NYIT, this is just a block away from where you are now. This is back in 1932, 31-32, in of course the height of the Great Depression. Back on no October 24th in 1929, the world saw Black Sunday. New York City in particular was very hard hit. Many people were evicted, they lost their homes, so they created these informal settlements called Hoovervilles after the name of the president, many blame for letting something so tragic happen. At the same time, in the context of this amazing site in Central Park is what was happening just a few blocks down south. And this is, of course, the construction of the Empire State Building that would see its completion also in 1932. Here, Perhaps we can see it much more clearly because it's unfinished. It allows us to see how much space there is to actually house the many people who are actually instead in Central Park, out in the cold, out in the heat, out in the moisture, unable to provide themselves or fend themselves. So that is the context in which the Damaxian house was developed. Particularities, as we can see here, Fuller not only presented it to the Architectural League of New York, he traveled the world, he presented it at department stores, he went to conferences, he tried to show how, for example, on the very first image on the left, he tried to show how his house is like a pneumatic house because you can inflate it and then in turn deflate it as you want to change, as you want to move, or as your community changes. Also on the right, we'll see how, for example, the extrapolation of this idea of a mass-produced house is a house that can actually be built with monkey wrenches. We can actually build our own houses with monkey wrenches because all the components, all the materials, everything has been designed to be actually creatable, to be actually possibly to be assembled just with our own hands and with some rudimentary tools. Extrapolating further and following alone what Fuller has been trying to make of his connection, of his inspiration by Le Corbusier, was really curious is to see how Fuller quickly realized or quickly decided, especially in the context of the style of modern architecture, 
highlighted by Mo by 1932, is, as we can see here on the quotation on the left, this evolution is well underway, but we hide it from our awareness through semantic error, typical of which is society's non-comprehension of what Le Corbusier meant when he said, a house is a machine for living. In this case, Fuller really took on the idea, not so much of living, but this idea that a house is a machine like any other machine. So first of all, the machine can be mass produced, could be deployed, can be also assembled and disassembled. But because it's a machine like any other instrument, the rooms comprising this particular machine could, in the second quotation, consist of a room, a room that should not be fixed, should not create a static mood, but should lend itself to change so that its occupants may play upon it as they would upon a piano. We're talking so far back in history in 1932, but really the connection with what we can think about today directly, perhaps impactful relative to your aspirations for your very new program is this notion of side by side, the two parts of making the connection between architecture or house with machine. The first is the machine produces the house. And the second is that the house is very much like a machine. Here you can see how Fuller, for example, took on the form directly of lighthouses. Examples of construction, examples of form, examples of structure, both heavy and light, and extrapolated directly into what he thought a house should be, could be, especially if it's modeled after a machine for real, as opposed to just saying it, or as opposed to just the aesthetics of machines. This idea of Fuller was quickly adopted here. For example, in 1935, popular mechanic magazine, already this idea that we can have houses that run itself. And not only that, we can have houses that run itself in all different forms. They don't have to look like Fuller's Dimaxian house. And here are some quotations highlighted as you see in the second and third page. One saying that, for example, imagine the ground surface the flooring of the living room actually has a display that tells you at what time or in how many minutes the tram or the bus or the subway is going to arrive so that you know perfectly when to exit your house in order to catch the next bus, the next subway. Or on the top right, this idea that the house is mass produced, it gets sent directly to your location, a team of skilled mechanics put it together, and in turn, you can spend very little to furnish it because there are specific furnishings already designed for the house itself. The house is so comprehensively capable of providing for you that it literally runs itself. So these ideas in 1935, back when we think about the kind of technologies in the interwar years and before all the advancements that we can associate with, of course, the advent of the Second War, it's really, I think, quite remarkable to think about the aspirations of an architecture or a house that runs itself. Moving forward, the other part, if we think about on the one side being ma machine produced, the other part is that of machine-like. We think about how this comes about, and this is a connection that we can make, for example, to the schematic of the turtle back in 1732. Here you can see Buckminster Fuller. He finished his military service in the US Navy as Lieutenant Junior Grade. He was in the service for three years during the height of the American involvement in the First War. But during that time, he earned two certificates. He was, first of all, the submarine cryptographic technician. And second of all, he was the radio man. In this image, you can see him here holding pieces of paper with a scissor at hand, ready to cut and paste together the coded messages that were printed on the rudimentary dot-like machines that transpose most code. You can also see him here next to a telephone, ready to communicate perhaps back and forth, orders, secrets, and so forth. But most importantly, this is a connection that we can imagine because Fuller has made it very explicit. In particular, if you see in the images on the right, the top, and the bottom, they both depict what is called a conning tower. A conning tower is a device that was particular to naval ships at this time, sort of ships that Fuller served, although he spent a lot more time on a transport ship. The conning tower was a place that was usually armored, that was usually closed off, which then, as you can see on the image at the top right, accounts for its very narrow, thin slits. The commanders inside, the captains inside, the persons inside would only be able to interact with the world through communication 
through channels of communication and interaction with the outside world because they are completely separated from the outside world. We think about the turtle as a section. We think about the surfaces in which we interact with the world. What Fuller does is this, take this idea of the conning tower and transplant it directly into the other component, that is to say the machine-like component of houses and of course, in turn, architecture. In this case, because of Fuller's involvement as a technician and radio man, exactly at the time when the US Navy was beginning to experiment with creating these wireless chains that could connect the world and also, of course, land and sea by radio, Fuller was deeply involved in, first of all, seeing the ramifications of this technology, and secondly, aspiring to imagining what it could be in the future, perhaps very much in the near future. This Fuller did here in this article called The Conning Tower, again in the 1932 issue of Shelter Magazine. The Conning Tower, in this case, as you can see, has been completely deconstructed without its heavy armored skin, without its closed environment. But instead, it looks now in section, as you can see on the top right, in section, it actually looks like a machine. Down below, Fuller envisioned an incredible library of books, of research assistants accessing those books, of encyclopedias, of data, facts, the latest statistics. And if necessary, the staff down below would also be able to communicate with libraries and experts around the world to relay answers directly to the people above who are discussing, thinking, planning out the world directly. This is the notion of the conning tower that is so particularly relevant to our idea. In this case here, the essence of interacting with the world is reduced to simply that, the communication from one part of the world to another, the communication from the privacy and comfort of your own home to the world at large that is facilitated by technology. Some of the highlighted text here include, for example, this notion that this particular device incorporates the latest technologies of television, projection, also the latest ways of two-way communication, which then combine to form something very much like what we're doing today, which is having a meeting over Zoom, listening to each other from miles, worlds apart. The last part now of this Dymaxian part of this lecture is from this article by Simon Brines, who was also one of the contributors to this issue of Shuttle Magazine. But in particular, here is Simon quoting Buckminster Fuller, to whom he also credits Longberg Holm, a Danish architect, for inspiring. Specifically, as you can see here, Fuller says, architecture develops its characteristic cognition through the evolutionary resultant space-time manifestations of the dominant forces successfully at play in any time and place. We can deconstruct these phrases, we can try to pass out these words. Many people have done so. Dissertations perhaps have been dedicated to exactly what Fuller meant when he used those particular words. But for us, for the purposes that we're concerned with today, in the context of interface and interactivity, for me, the key word is successively. Dominant forces successfully at play, meaning that the forces change, they change over time. So just like Fuller thinking about architecture, which accommodates change, in this case, we have to understand that the moment we think about forces that are successive means that we cannot take anything for granted. We cannot take it for granted, for example, our requirements for today, for the now, for this particular material, or for this way of living is something we can rely upon. We cannot instead think about the house as a place of permanence or refuge or consistency, a place that we can always go to because our notion of a home really can be something that is highly contingent depending on what we need and how we develop over our years. Now we transition to the second part, more specifically the geo as a prefix. In this case, following another quotation from Fuller, also inspired by Longberg Home, You can see here Fuller talking about home. He was the first architect in my knowledge ever to talk about the ultimately invisible architecture. In 1929, when I first met him, he said, the greatest architect in history 
would be the one who finally developed the capability to give humanity completely effective environmental control without any visible structure and machinery. In this case, then, if we think about later on, the many different manifestations of this idea of the geo, we can see that Fuller really aspired to realizing, in this case, the ambitions, or let's say the challenge laid down by Thornburg Home, that the greatest architect in history is someone who's going to be able to provide the requirements of architecture without visible structure, and even without machinery, even without machinery, for example, of his Dimaxian house, even without the machinery of all the various interfaces that Fuller thought about when he conceived of his Dimaxian house. That is very much the basis of this idea of the geo, specifically the idea of disappearing structure and machinery, what happens behind the scenes. The very first manifestation of the idea of geo is, if we go back to this idea of surfaces, interfaces, and so forth, changing how we interact with the world, literally. In this case, we separate the world with these great circles, the geodesic lines. And because of that, we no longer have to think about north and south, east and west, as always up and down, right or left. But instead, depending on what we want to highlight, we can see the world completely differently. Sometimes we see the world as a series of islands very far apart from Antarctica. Sometimes we see the world here, as you can see the air ocean map, we see the world as one island surrounded by oceans, which was one of the ways by which Fuller, for example, suggested specifically that we should all be trying to work together. Instead of thinking about us living on such distant, separated, distinct continents, look at this map instead. If you look at this map, if you rotate it and you realize there's no up or down, there's no particular orientation, you may very well think about the world as consisting only of one big island of which we are all member and party to. And because of that, we should all thereby work together. This notion of working together is visible here. As you can see, this is uh, on the ground, a map of the Diamaxian map laid out so that you can see the world. Here is Fuller conceiving of an idea for the World Expo in 1967. This is an early rudimentary idea when Fuller imagined this structure which suspends you above this supersized shifting map of the world. You can walk around, you can see, you can see that there's no particular orientation and you can interact with all different ways of seeing the world, thereby visualizing not just the actual problems of the world, but also its actual possible solutions. This idea of Fuller would quickly directly envision much more literally into this sphere. Here on the left, suspended in front of the recently completed UN building on the East River, so that everyone in the UN can look across the river and see the ramifications of their actions, of their votes, of what they're promoting, or also what they're ignoring. Some other iterations, these are perhaps better known to you in from your history classes, some other iterations of the idea of the geo is something as simple as, for example, on the right, this frame out of the geodesic geometry with a continuous surface inside which protected the inside from the elements, a very light house that could be lifted literally just by half a dozen people. Also, this idea of the geo could be adopted directly to enclose an environment inside of which can be a house actually of your choice, could be a box, could be a motorhome, could be just a space, but most importantly, it's already inside this geodesic surface, this geodesic dome, actually, that you see Fuller creating, playing with, manipulating on the left. In the middle image, you see Fuller still working with some of his early experiments until he started extrapolating upon really how he could realize Newt, uh, Lomberg Holmes' challenge, as we mentioned before. This is from 1959, image of the Sokoniki Park, a dome that Fuller created, which then very quickly led to his work in 1967, where he envisioned a much, much bigger dome, not just a surface where we can see projections, but also a surface which was inhabitable by large groups of people passing through, which really let the outside in and also let us interface with the inside directly. 
you can see some of the ideas here realize this building actually it's still in montreal it's still there even though it's plexiglass surface had long since burned away the structure was so strong so durable that it's still there forming the housing the outer perimeter of the botanical gardens on this island in montreal we look more closely at how fuller deployed this particular dome we can see how first of all fuller really represented his technology his idea as a strong contrast to what was happening just across the river if you can see by the image on the bottom left you see the geodesic dome almost not there almost invisible so thin with light members completely transparent as opposed to across the way where we see the pavilion of the soviet union with a big roof and at the same time exposing its structure exposing its heavy concrete pairs and exposing its very straightforward despite its roof it's very straightforward conception of enclosure creating spaces creating levels here in this article from life magazine describing fuller's dome this is the quotation saying that the dome could have been the imagery of a mad poet or a god it is a transparent double bubble flung up by the us that breaks the sky 20 stories high and across the way the russians have instead only hung walls of glass on a ski jump on a roof the comparison between the two is really quite compelling especially if we think about how the soviet union at the time was trying to use the world expo as a way to expose itself to expose its expertise expose itself as an alternative to what of course the united states of america was proposing here What's very curious now is actually the connection. This is in 1967. We can see laid out much more directly and perhaps more forcefully the limitations or let's say the conventionalism, the normative structure of the Soviet pavilion that could simply not compete with Fuller's Dome just on the other side of the river. But if we go back now to the 1932 issue of Shadow Magazine, we also see Fuller specifically describing what he hoped would be realizable in the future of the Soviet Union. On the left, he lays out some recent winners of the competition for the first Soviet palace. And on the bottom two examples, he emphasizes, he promotes an alternative submission, a dome, surprisingly, for the Soviet pavilion back in 1932, where he thought the dome actually was the most formative, the most emblematic figure structure machinery that could fully express the optimism the achievement the scientific know-how of the soviet union even back in 1932. if we see these two projects side by side we see this fancy massive ski lift next to fuller's dome perhaps we see something just like this on the left, that image you see is the tramway that was actually created to allow visitors to the World Expo to pass fully through that surface, continuing up to the escalators. On the right, we see Soviet Union, of course, highlighting the achievements of their cosmonauts of their space program. Both sides were highlighting the space program, but only one side was able to show what the future of architecture really could be like. That is to say, an architecture that actually disappeared that actually was rendered invisible because its dimensions have been reinforced because its dimensions have been minimized because its materials have been carefully curated this leads us then to the last part of this lecture i hope we still have time yes yeah where we talk about the application specifically coming back to this idea of Fuller talking about environmental control without any visible structure and machinery, specifically talking about not so much the machine produced, but the machine like. What is the machine like? And in turn, what do I mean when I try to take on these ideas and apply to my own work? Specifically, one application of this is that of thinking about hardware and software as a way to define two general aspects of what we do every day as architectural designers or even more generally as designers. Hardware is what is physical. Hardware is what is static. 
hardware is different than software because software is dynamic. It is ephemeral. It changes. It can be reprogrammed. Just like the advancement brought on by the iPhone, for example, now so many years ago, this idea of a surface that could only be touched, that did not really need any buttons, has now brought upon its own amazing industry of different ways of interacting with the surfaces, with the screen. You can swipe it, you can touch it, you can see information, and then you can move away to see another information all directly, even without any limitations of the hardware. If we see this typical image of a city, this is traffic flowing through a city, very advanced city, massive overpasses, traffic flowing freely, smoothly, people inside the buildings. There's a great distinction between what is in motion versus what is static. We can sometimes think about the software as the information that is actually passing through here, the arteries of the scene, and everything else around it that is literally static to be the hardware which facilitates this movement. However, more specifically, and perhaps more ominously, this system that we can see expressed here often breaks down. Very famously, in China, back in 19, uh, 2019, uh, Beijing experienced the very famous traffic jam that lasted 12 days that was hundreds of miles long. This particular traffic jam tied up the city. As you can see here, the cars were unable to escape. People were unable to escape. People had to camp out under their cars, under the buses in order to survive. People had to climb off the overpasses and highways in order to access food. This is what happens when something like what we saw before breaks down. In this case, it breaks down because there's no way out. The roads, as efficiently as they are, as directed towards smooth curvatures and high speed, as advanced as they are, these amazing arteries that we correlated with information before still cannot account for changes. Changes, perhaps, as you think about the beating of a butterfly's wings, changes, in this case, a few hundred miles away from Beijing that brought about this amazing, massive standstill in traffic that lasted days and days and really paralyzed the city. In contrast, in contrast with the hardware that we can see here, all the things that we associate with a modern metropolis, we have this particular approach, which I would argue emphasizes the software. And if we see this video, it's important at the same time, not just to look at what we can see, but also try to hear how this is happening. In this crazy intersection from Vietnam, famously, especially in terms of transportation design, famous for not having signal lights at many of its busiest intersections, you see people moving much more slowly, but because they're moving much more slowly and also because of the scale at which they're moving, meaning in this case, mostly scooters or single pedestrians, because of that, they can negotiate this very complex intersection without any guidance, without any lines painted in the ground, without any signal. This is a very simple piece of hardware just an open plaza. This is also a hardware of absence, meaning that there are specifically no signal lights, no directions, no guides as to how to behave. But because of that, it's still actually possible to navigate because this particular space emphasizes entirely software, software that cannot be visualized, meaning, for example, that light of the vehicles passing by, the sound of the scooters beeping their way through so others can hear them. People walking through using not just their eyes, but also all their various senses in order to negotiate and time and estimate the best way to which they can cross this very crazy plaza. This for me then is the great divide between hardware and software. On the one hand, over control, over determined, on the other hand here, underdetermined, but because of that, very accommodating to change. This brings us now to some of the applications that we imagine. In this case here, I was in charge of a series of design studios co-taught with Chris Perry, 
for a period of four years over at Pratt Institute. This was for our degree project. We explored this notion of sensory architecture, as you can see connoted here by its logo. We thought about the idea almost like a touch as if we're touching a button that architecture at its very essence is not just a place in which we live, but is actually the very first contact point we have with the whole world, thereby thinking again about architecture as an interface with the world at large. In terms of some of the research we undertook, we specifically looked at how we see the world. From all the various ways by which we experience pain, we smell, we see, we touch, we sometimes feel balance from our equilibrium, to more complex diagrams that describe how we actually visualize spaces and how we have very specific contact points on the soles of our feet, which make us very sensitive to displacements from horizontal, which makes us very sensitive to slight changes in angle and also pressures back and forth. Because of that, in our particular studio, we explored ways of realizing the application of these ideas directly. Here, some environmental design. Here, some different flow charts of interactivity that changes depending on how someone is moving through a certain space. Here are different diagrams following the trajectories of the human figure, either as a heat map or also as maps of tactician where the human finger or human touch can actually reach the outer boundaries of the surface, how we process this information, how we translate touch into what's located on our skin, how we translate what you see directly into a way that, for example, merges the vision, the very distinct visions of our right and left eyes into a stereo image. In turn, we explored specifically ways to create senses of enclosure using these ideas. You can see some of these basic rudimentary devices moving along. You can see the devices deployed at scale that can then respond to someone passing through the space or aggregations of people that actually open up a space and expand the space as needed, as required, as programmed, as opposed to always being the same. In this case here, a kind of feeding tube but of a human being passing through a certain space, which uses the various, in this case, I suppose we can call them uh, tentacles almost, or really like pressure sensors that extend from the surface that allow a human body to be moved along a certain direction, along the longitudinal axis of what we see here in section. As well on the left and the right, in this case, this is some time ago, back when we were still rather rudimentary in our conceptions of applying sensor technologies to the human body. We can see here different ways of cladding ourselves in different kinds of senses. In addition to cladding ourselves here, we can think of different ways of extending the envelope of our cladding to provide shelter and enclosure in a way that adopts itself to different scales. And then in turn brings people together to form various communities, in this case, for example, here, being able to occupy the water's surface above or below, along a surface that expands and contracts depending on program and even perhaps depending upon the water pressure. Here, the same idea is extrapolated to actually form a community that is anchored to the right along the front of the beach where we have stable ground, but because of that, we can actually expand this surface, allow it to expand out into the water surface as needed and then contract and close again as needed. Last, I'll be showing you three quick videos of some more clear narrative guides of the kind of work that we have been working on over at Pratt Institute over a degree project for our graduating students. In this case, here's the first project on a site in Bryant Park where our students explored different ways of realizing structure. Surfaces here that are continuously defined, closed that holds something, open that reveals something, and in this case applied directly into that great lawn in front of Bryant Park. 
In particular, the students here were reacting to the loss of the stacks, or rather the displacement of the stacks that is usually held underneath Bryant Park. Evacuated the books, the students visualize an idea where the whole surface of the park becomes an interface, which allows different kinds of programs to take place. Programs can be brought in at different scales, which include furniture, very much like actually the furniture that we so often see today in Bryan Park, just not as advanced, of course, but also once we think about this capacity, we can think about the deployment of these capacities throughout the site, how it can aggregate across, how it can actually allow different ranges of programs to happen all the way through, instead of always having just grass and instead of always just having the same space above or below. The second project is here by another group of students from a few years ago, proposing an expansion of the community center. Instead of thinking about a community center as a closed building where you have perhaps a larger space where activity could take place, here the students talk about deploying technologies, deploying notions of interactivity, deploying the latest and the greatest in order to visualize a community center that is actually literally in the community that can be distributed, that can be disseminated, that can be accessible throughout the whole neighborhood. And in this case here, it actually is a machine that allows the inhabitants of a particular area to see, to hear, to touch at different scales, that aggregates, that populates the surface, that has different sizes and different capacities and as well different materials in this case in the vertical direction as opposed to the horizontal that we saw before. It provides power, it charges your phone and it can spread out as a series of networks. In this case, they imagine a specific deployment of this system throughout a site and area rather in park slope. By bringing together all these different technologies they imagine that the community center in this case really engages the community because it allows many people, even people who are just passing through, even people who are just casually unable to access physical space can still interact and exchange with each other. Now, this particular fanciful project, as you can see here depicted, occupying the side of a building was realized back when we still didn't have the mobile devices that we are now so familiar with. So this was very much a means, a way of conceiving of the connectivity that is now afforded today by our mobile devices, but in physical form in a way that is universally accessible. And the last project here, also from a few years ago, also taught in collaboration with Chris Perry, is how the idea of interaction, of interactivity can very much be synthesized directly with the idea of industrial or machine production. In this case, a group of students here developed the structure and also the machine for an informal settlement for refugees over a site, over for a site in Jenin. This area at the time was very much in the news for the poor conditions of the Palestinian refugees who were ever increasingly aggregating in this area. So they visualized a system where machines of uniform scale, of uniform size and components could be deployed to this area, could be assembled with a monkey wrench. But because of its inherent design and because of its connectivity across different scales, these surfaces could actually combine to actually conjoin to create larger surfaces as needed allowing for different kinds of enclosure as needed without relegating to residents just to one kind of enclosure. Consisting of a kit of parts, here in this case, fanciful ribs that are specially bent in order to create the necessary curvature, thereby realizing a strength associated normally with this kind of curvature, which then allows itself to be the scaffold for surfaces, which again, like the examples we saw before, the surfaces here can be occupied in different ways using different programs and different materials. And most importantly, these components can be joined together for something as simple as, for example, in this very dry drought-like climate, harvesting rainwater, collecting it, storing it, filtering it, 
so that the building itself is very much part of the system that allows its residents to be able to survive in the area. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Great lecture. Uh, I actually enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I, I'm, I'm actually very happy that it was the, the first this semester because we were uh, discussing uh, the relevance of Buckminster Fuller in terms of thinking construction in a different way. And um, you actually took us through the history of that in relationship to the difference between Le Corbusier and Buckminster Fuller's notion of um, a machine to live in and machine as architecture. So I, I appreciate that. And also in the last projects that you're doing in terms of uh, with uh, Chris Perry sensory architecture, that notion uh, keeps, keeps coming back. I have a, a couple of questions um, regarding your presentation. Um, some of the most important issues that you touch on that, uh, and the reason why I'm interested in back Mr. Fuller is uh, Fuller's uh, conception and actually physical construction uh, in very different terms in, uh, of what uh, an architectural structure is and what an architectural structure means. But not only, I mean, you introduce it from a very uh, interesting architectural point of view, right? Like you say, okay, but Mr. Fuller, first of all, uh, thinks about construction in a very different way, right? And, and you mentioned the fact of this gigantic building that was uh, designed to be actually first to drop a bomb and create the excavation out of a bomb and then fly into the building, a crazy, right? Like very different way of understanding uh, architecture, even from the tectonic of building up, right, is coming from above, right, and also the the weight, right, like reducing everything to its minimal weight, understand structure in terms of a maximal uh, capacity, mm -hmm. different materials altogether, um, different way of uh, conceptualizing construction, but uh, you did not uh, focus that much on uh, his uh, way of understanding structures altogether as a structural engineering. So I wonder if you can say, uh, because also I know that we, we share many different reviews with you discussing the, the work of uh, Fuller and uh, uh, talking with you about, uh, because, you know, with Michael Su, by the way, for the students, we, we did together uh, Acadia 2010, uh, back in 2010, a, a very large compu computational um, uh, conference and uh, the name of the conference was uh, Life Information with Aaron Sprecher, Shai Hayahu, uh, Axel Schmitzberger, and um, um, and um, what's the the partner of Aaron? What was his name? Uh, Chandler Arens, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, we were dealing with information theory uh, back then in 2010. And uh, you're talking about uh, information theory uh, in relationship to Fuller. I just wonder if you can talk a little bit more about how you think he thought of structures, of uh, reducing the structural members to its maximum capacity. Uh, and I think that, you know, he was working also um, with uh, Wagner, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, computation, computability, information systems, universal constructors, right? So I just wonder if you can say something about how you think about Mr. Fuller uh, devised the problem of structures altogether. Well, first thing I would say is Buckminster Fuller was amazingly lucky. Right? He had this idea of building a house that could be transported, that is industrially produced, that functions as a machine to interact with the world. And he came up with, on the one hand, the conning tower, and the, on the other hand, the Maxon house. He took the Maxon house, he tried to realize it, it became the Wichita house and a few other iterations, but he couldn't get very far because of course, with the shape, with the geometry, with the material, it was not really realizable, his ambition. In the case of him exploring this idea of the geodesic architecture, and perhaps in turn his fascination with making these maps. First, we have to think that without him making the Namaxian maps, he would not have hit upon the amazing structural capacity of geodesic geometries. But once he did, 
just like the background behind me, it's absolutely amazing. You can cover and enclose such a large area with such little material. And of course, you know, from some of the pictures you saw, there was Buckminster Fuller holding some geostatic geometries. His early experiments were really famous, or rather infamous, because he tasked his architecture students, as he was an itinerant architecture professor, like some of us still are today. He was an itinerant architecture professor at all different schools, where he asked his students to take long flimsy tape and join it together into a sphere and to get enough of them so that somehow he can maintain the shape of a sphere. Right. But through years and years of work, and also, of course, as you noted, his collaboration with Sadao in particular, who I think was instrumental in realizing the actual structure, he made it possible by thinking about the combination of hexagons and pentagons that actually form some of the principal, most basic geodesic surfaces. So Fuller really got extremely lucky because he really realized what he set out to do. Now, of course, you know, generally speaking, let's us think about why we don't see geodesic structures so much today. If you see in my background, the geodesic structure has the advantage. All the members are roughly the same size. Sometimes they're really exactly the same size. So it means that one hexagon is like any other. They have the same dimensions, they have the same depth, the material has the same thickness. So you can assemble all of them together. And in fact, you can assemble it from the ground up by having a mast in the middle and just build your way line by line as you lift up the mast. The disadvantage, however, and the main reason we don't see geodesic domes so much today is if you see behind me, every single segment of that hexagon is a line or the surface can leak. So the image you see is from the 1967 World Expo. To realize the structure, to make it strong enough relative to the distribution of the materials they had, they welded all the connections. When they were repairing these connections because the structure was beginning to shift due to differential heating of the surface, they accidentally ignited some of the plexiglass panels. And the fire burned so quickly and so much out of control that it quickly consumed the whole surface. And all that is left is what we see today, just the open skeleton. And it still has not been clad because it's impossible to seal all those surfaces. Now, some of you may have seen recently, perhaps uh, very famously in Las Vegas, they're now building the world's largest dome. Right? That dome has an IMAX theater of extreme size inside. But also on the outside, its full surface is actually rendered in LED. Even something that big actually was not buildable out of the geodesic structure because they couldn't seal all the surfaces. So in this case, I would argue for the notion of structure as a way to understand how this fanciful surface gets tied down to the ground through geodesic geometry. And that was for Fuller, a way out of realizing his ambition based on what he started out with and really seeing it come to life at the end. So there is a problem of, uh, because you, you also mentioned the fact that uh, his idea of making it invisible, right? Uh, so there is a problem of uh, maximum span with sort of like an invisible uh, structure, mm -hmm. right? Almost, yes. right? And um, at least, you know, th there is a notion of reduction, right? Like a, a little bit like following me as um, uh, uh, less is more, right? Re but reduction to reconsider altogether because me as, for instance, right, is a reduct mm -hmm. reductive process. Although one can argue that uh, Fuller's reductive process is, is really a different understanding altogether of physics, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, he, he really takes the dimensional quality of uh, tensile strength and compressive strength to, to an extreme uh, scene like no other. And that's why the innovation comes in terms of the typology, right? Uh, as opposed to Mies, that the typology is not really transformed by the, um, by the use of the material, right? Like Mies reduces everything. Uh, but the typology in architecture does not really change. I mean, it is a different typology, yes, uh, with a free plan, the structure is uh, outside the envelope, but it's not a new conception of uh, the architectural container. I mean, it is, uh, 
but it's not as radical as Fuller. So I, I appreciate a lot the, the, the insights that you gave us on Fuller's work and also how you're thinking in terms of your own work, uh, what you're doing, doing at Pratt uh, relative to um, environments, right? Like sensor interactivity and environments and the, the shifting of the relation between the structure and uh, how uh, people interact. Uh, with these systems. But um, uh, thank you so much, Michael. I'm, I want to have the students uh, now uh, participate and, and raise some questions in relationship to what you presented. I don't know if, uh, uh, by the way, we have uh, some students are online, some students are there in person in, in New York City. We were supposed to meet in, in Old Westbury today, but we changed. That's why we're, we have some people, uh, I'm online and some students are there. But, um, I don't know, Farah, Salma, Yusef, or Kavia, if you have any questions for Michael. Yeah, Yusef, uh, the, uh, the mic is uh, muted. Well, I was just going to ask if you, uh, if Professor Michael, would suggest um, any books or any, like, a place to start reading about sensory architecture, since he, he has so much knowledge about. So where would be a good start? Where would be a, a good place to start? Well, I suppose a good place to start would be that publication Chris and I put together based on the students' work. But also, I think it's important that sensory architecture exists at a scale that we're all able to access, meaning we all live in the world. You smell, you breathe, you see, you touch. That is what unites us. This is, of course, our human condition, the fact that we can interact with the world and then we can do something about it. We can change it. We can choose what we want to do. We can choose what we want to see. So there's something very, let's say, democratic about the notion of sensory architecture because it doesn't require knowledge of construction. It doesn't require knowledge of the history of architecture. It requires only that instead, and here I am parroting a bit some of the words of Fuller, it requires only that you are much more in tune with how you interact with the world. If we think about the interface, the very first interface we have is of course our human body. And the advancement, or let's say the development of Fuller's idea is to take that and transpose it into architecture as the first removal of that idea, that boundary. So in this case, you know, besides looking at different books, understanding how we actually interact with the world, which could involve, for example, looking through medical books, which is what our students mostly did. The second part of that is to realize for yourself how you think you want to interact with the world. Because you know what we're doing today, it's really, it's really remarkable if we think about it, how Fuller back in 32 really predicted or aspired to something like we're doing today. We have the internet. We have an amazing, although problematic resource, which answers all the questions we may have. We can make decisions quickly with authority. We can connect with each other, see each other, communicate with each other, convey our ideas across whole worlds. All these are ways by which Fuller thought could be realized if we start with a house. So instead of, let's say, to simplify this idea of sensory architecture, a way to do so is really think about a house as the computer, as the interface itself directly, because the house is the first envelope displaced from our human bodies. That's a, a good point. And actually, I just want to uh, point out that uh, the way that we are understanding architecture is as an interface. Last semester, we actually worked all the way from survey, um, thinking about uh, capturing what the world is processing information real time and actually feedbacking in the form of an interface and an application. Mm -hmm. And this semester we're thinking actually in um, uh, construction, right? Like thinking all together the systems of construction. But, uh, you know, uh, some of the notions that uh, I would like the students to activate is survey back again in a different terms. That's why we, we started actually recording the room where we are operating with uh, thermal cameras. Uh, we are doing um, a survey, a three-dimensional survey of, of the room. And if you continue with that logic, uh, similar to what we studied last semester, we can actually engage construction in interactive terms, right? Like thinking about environmental conditions and the, reaction, the relationship of the architecture as an interface and its relationship to the body. And uh, we can actually in involve uh, some physical compute computing, right? Uh, we can actually uh, start thinking about sensors and record back uh, 
the uh, thermal information that we are actually processing in the room and feedback that into the form of the uh, construction that we're doing. The students are actually, each of them, they're working with a different technology. Uh, we're working with 3D printing, uh, robotic fabrication. Where each of them, they're going to choose a different machine and they're going to execute uh, a, an, an architectural typology. And hopefully that architectural typology is going to be engaged with environmental systems. So your lecture is actually perfect for, for the context of the, of the studio as well. Um, I don't know if uh, Salma, yeah, Salma, you have your, your hand is up or no? Salma or Farah, yeah? So um, I want to uh, thank you, first of all, for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you about the notion of materiality, because I think that materiality, when we talk about sensorial architecture, uh, we talk, we think automatically about the material, how the material feels, how the material is present in the architectural space. And so I was wondering, how do you bring together this notion of uh, sensorial architecture and materiality, but at the same time, the idea of fueler um, about like the invisibility and the materiality, uh, the materiality in his like geo projects the, in his latest works. Well, for Fuller, he was famous for saying, "Let's try to do the most with the least." He's the one who really brought in this word in common usage these days, especially in the context of architecture and also I think the kind of computational technologies you're talking about, and that is the word ephemeral, right? Instead of thinking about perhaps, you know, materiality as something you can touch, materiality really is something that you can interact with in many different ways, right? In this case, it's not just the human senses, but also conceptually, whether or not you can understand what is the embedded software of a place, just like that busy intersection in Vietnam. If you think about that whole area, that whole plaza, it's a 3D space, right? It makes a difference if you're down below, it makes a difference if you're a child, it makes a difference if you're in your car, in your enclosed environment, and it makes a difference if you're in a scooter. So if you see this field inside this plaza, inside this square in Vietnam, everything inside that space is full of information. And so the materiality of that space is full, even though we can't see it even though we can't draw it. Given the technologies we have today, imagine related to kind of the work you do, perhaps you can think about mapping, mapping a trajectory of someone just going through that space, how they move their head about to hear where traffic is coming. How do they estimate the time of arrival of this particular trajectory? How do they account for how much they have to deviate? How do they collaborate with another person directly in front of them or another scooter coming directly at them? How do they negotiate to tell them which side to go, which side not to go? So in other words, in the context of sensory architecture, the response to this idea of materiality is the world is full of material and we are quote unquote touching it in all different ways. And what's important as Pablo was saying is to determine what information you actually want to sense. Some of which are more normative like light, like heat, like temperature, like pressure, but others are entirely your own. You can, for example, try to measure the happiness of a place. How do you measure the happiness of a place? You have to measure many things, not just what you imagine, such as light, such as air, such as temperature, but perhaps you have to imagine the happiness of a place in the context of where it's located. Is a square being a relief in the European direction? Um, a relief from the density of medieval layouts is a square naturally a place of happiness because it gives you this separation, this respite from otherwise irregular tight streets, or is the square actually a place that takes the inverse, that actually focuses and concentrates people all together, thereby not giving you this relief, but actually giving you the possibility of pressure that you normally would not have because you can have crowds throngs of people you can hear, you can have a big festival or event all through this shared common space where you not only are in the same space with many people, but you also hear them with all the sounds reflected from the surfaces that form from the facades of that space. I hope that in some way answers what you're asking. You also mentioned an interesting fact, Michael, which is the, the fact that the material, because there is a, to me, there is a, I mean, I, I I always discuss this with you and, and, and Chris, the issue of uh, material sens sensorial aspect ver versus uh, 
Uh, I'm more interested in deeper structures than in sensorial structures, uh, things that are more in the back uh, than in the front. But uh, obviously, I also deal with things that you touch and you smell and so on. But uh, one of the interesting things that you said is the material as a, a what the material can do instead of how does it feels like. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the notions that we're trying to activate this semester is the logic of the material as uh, something that you can program, right? Like something that you can uh, uh, interact with. And um, we are actually thinking about it. The students are actually just starting uh, their projects and uh, hopefully there, there will be some kind of uh, uh, motivation to think beyond co the convention in terms of materiality. Another aspect that you that I, I think is very interesting that you say is the uh, what are the, the things that you can measure versus the things that you cannot measure. And if you cannot measure them, how do you find, because that's another, as, as, you know, our program, we deal with the issue of survey as, a, as, a, as the beginning of uh, the architectural signifier, right? And uh, we're trying to, to depict how we can survey things that had not been surveyed. So I appreciate the fact that you're saying uh, that the act of measurement in a way, it's an exploration. It's not something that is given. And in that sense, uh, the, the, to me, the, the way to avoid the normative is, you know, we play a trick in this program, which is we provide some technology. But at the same time, and at a certain point, you actually need to develop your own instruments of measurement so that you can actually expand what is measurable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, hopefully, the, the, you know, something clicks in the student because it's all the way from how the project starts and what you think you are mapping. Uh, and the issue of mapping already engages with a system of measurement and an, and an instrument, right? That perhaps you want to, as a student or as a creative architect, uh, you may want to create your own eventually. Mm -hmm. Very much so. It's hardest when we try to measure things that are important, like happiness, right? It's so important. We all, I imagine, aspire to design happy spaces. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit scared of the concept of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a way that uh, I don't, you know, like, for instance, you know, that and it's something generational. I think that, you know, the modern movement, they were uh, more interested in health. Mm -hmm. and providing a new notion of happiness, right? Mm -hmm. Or, for instance, Fuller's uh, geodesic dome, right? If, uh, so I think that, in a way, it's, a, it's also you have to wonder how do you change? Because comfort, if you look for comfort, you don't arrive to the, to the modern movement, right? Or if you look for happiness, I'm not sure if you would create the Bill Sawa or the, or the, or the geodesic dome, but I think that you're... you're you're saying something deeper than uh, conventional happiness, right? Like perhaps something that goes beyond uh, and engages health and, and so on, right? Uh, I suppose, I hope so. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, the more basic part is, again, following Fuller himself saying that, hey, a house is your house, right? So first of all, it shouldn't be locked down in a certain place right? because you move around. Okay, maybe you like living here one day. Maybe it gets too cold like today in the winter. So now you want to move your house elsewhere. Why not think of your house like your car and free yourself from the ground? That is the first part. But once you do so, then the whole house become contingent to the fact that you can change it. And so as Fuller said, you know, he really envisioned a house that is machine-like in the sense that you can play upon it like an instrument, like you play upon the piano. And if we think about his very connection. Every time he manifested his early version of the Damaxian house, he always had singers, pianists depicted in that space because he literally really imagined a space as a place that elicits happiness in this case by allowing you to, let's say, explore your interests by allowing you to change the environment. So you never feel like you're always in the same space so that your space becomes something you have control over instead of just a space you occupy. And perhaps in this case, you know, not so much I'm thinking about the deeper kind of happiness, but just the idea that architecture affords us this flexibility. That in itself gives us 
much greater mandate for our own happiness, whatever it may be, because now we can shape our world. And then we can shape how we connect with not just our immediate world, our house, but also, of course, with the world at large. And that is perhaps what I would suggest. Interesting. Uh, uh, Farah, Kavya, I don't know if you have any questions for Michael. No? All right. Uh, Kavya? No. Uh, yeah, in, right. in terms of that submarine and the Vietnam, uh, the street, where, I mean, it, it, I mean, you define it define it as the architecture is the interfaces. It's the uh, membrane. The uh, it's it's a it's kind of a membrane between the interfaces and the interactivity. But isn't it more more like survival over there? Survival, you mean in a submarine? Yeah, in the submarine and while crossing the street is it wasn't it like it wasn't it more like a survival? Well, in that particular context. By all means, absolutely. In a submarine, you're trying to stay safe, trying to be mobile. In the street, you're trying to navigate. But, you know, in both instances, they're connected by this idea that human body, right, needs an interface, needs an outer envelope with which to interact with the world. And so in this case, this is why I think we can make a connection with Fuller's aspirations for what a house could be, what a house should be, is that... The particular context is not as important as the idea of interface, because once you think about an interface immediately, it's something that's changeable. And because it's an interface, because it's something that's changeable immediately, it allows you to interact with that environment because it's a back and forth. The interface depends on interactivity. The interactivity changes the interface. It's not static. In this case, it's very much like, I suppose, you know, I keep coming back to this example, the screen of the iPhone. It's so formative. We take it so much for granted. But until the iPhone came about, everybody thought you needed a button to know you push something, which means that it was fixed. That was always the button. Sure, you can have different functions in combination with other buttons, but that's what a button does. The button could never relay, display information. And so if you read some of the history of the development of the iPhone, what's really compelling is they quickly realized that it can only work if you don't distinguish between a surface that responds to your touch and a surface that allows you to see. And once they overcame this impasse and they realized that, you know, our human finger, when you push something, you actually compress the skin. And we can use that cue as a way to understand that we don't have to keep buttons. Once they overcome this idea, they realized that, hey, they should just go with the screen. And of course, you know, if you see some of the early iPhone screens versus the apps we have today, they are amazingly different, right? The phone has taken on so much more capacity, extended to even the watch. The phone has taken on so much capacity exactly because the hardware is just one very basic component. What's more important is the software. So in this case, in response specifically to a caveat, if you think about a submarine or the street in Vietnam, right? If you think about one as just, you know, survival or another as survival of a different sort, then you're focusing still on the hardware. Instead, focus on the software. Focus on the software just as much as the hardware and then understand that hardware influences software back and forth so that you don't design them in isolation. And more importantly, you don't design a machine saying, hey, this is the hardware part of the machine. These are the sensors. And inside this is the computation. That's a software part of the machine. But the software part of the machine can also feedback to the hardware itself to change what the hardware is doing. So that this is, I suppose, a way to synthesize what I think about when I use the term in my own work called machinic architecture, meaning that you design hardware and software equally at the same time without limiting one or without focusing on the other. You know, uh, it's very interesting that you're mentioning that because uh, when we discuss uh, the generation of this program, um, my argument was exactly that one, very similar to that one. And by the way, uh, um, um, that, that was a discussion, the difference between uh, Microsoft and, and, and Apple, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The original discussion in the 19, 1980s, uh, the ideological difference, right, was that Windows... Um, was all about the exchange of the hardware as the software, right? Like you could replace any hardware part, right? 
and the soft as well as the software, right? Uh, whereas uh, uh, Apple, right, um, the, the, their differentiating marketing campaign was that for each software, there would be a parallel hardware. Mm -hmm. And that's what made the, uh, it's actually an information theory um, problem, right? Like, do you specify for the assembler code, for the, the kind of processing uh, information theory, do you relate to a specific hardware or you don't, right? And uh, Windows took the approach of abstract machines, right? So software uh, can be coded in abstract from the physical component. Whereas uh, Mac, the uh, you know Apple through the Mac and so on, the evolution of Mac took the idea of relating a unique uh, object of design, hardware, in relationship to a unique software product. And uh, um, when we were thinking about this program, uh, that question came in because um, initially the idea was to develop uh, only a fabrication program, and my uh, my uh, position was actually not to do that, to actually think of uh, interfaces and information theory on the relation between software and hardware so that we do not uh, think about um, uh, architecture as either an abstract machine and architecture either as a construction physical element, but on the interrelationship and continuity between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way that uh, the students were going to try to activate notions of uh, physicality and construction through information theory instead of like just thinking about the abstract uh, ideal digital model and how you build it we're actually going to uh, try to activate information theory in terms of the relationship between how you code things and what happens at the physical uh, terminal of the machine so this is a perfect uh, way of uh, perhaps uh, finishing the discussion michael uh, because uh, I, I'm actually, uh, I, I thought that it was a good idea to invite you, but now I am extremely happy that we did it and that we started with you because it was very appropriate on the transition between what we did last semester and what we're doing now. So I really want to thank you uh, for your precision and your actually your research on Fuller and your work at Pratt uh, uh, that has been great through many years and uh, all the collaborations that we did together. So. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, perhaps we, we, I don't know if you have any final words or any comments. And if not, we stop the streaming and, and we just uh, informally have a small chat and then we'll let you go. I would add one notion, which is notion that uh, I use as the opening quotation for the syllabus for my architectural interface class. And that's a quotation by Rem Kuhas when he says, architects are the best positioned to be, let's say, generalists, where they can take an information, they can look at diagrams, they can create a world and make sense of the world. This, I think, is what I would add for your students. If we think about what you're doing now, a lot of times you can say, hey, why don't I do this in an engineering school? Why don't I do this in a fabrication workshop? What's particular about a mess in architecture, computational technologies? Why do we need any association at all with architecture. And in response, I would say exactly this. We need the architect to bring in the software because it's only the architect who can think about the human sense, the human condition, the human being, separate from all the machines. There's a reason why Fuller was so successful as an outsider without being an architect or engineer. And hopefully, I imagine very much so for your program, it will be the same, that it is because of what you aspire to through your notions of software that the technologies you work with, that you create and you realize, advance much more than what could be done in any other engineering computational program. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Thank you for coming and thank you for joining us. I'm now going to stop 